Hello and welcome to Meet Rosie, the rating observation scale for inspiring environments, bringing aesthetics into the classroom. My name is Stephanie Camoni and I am a program quality assessor for the Pennsylvania Key and I'm so excited to share this program observation instrument. Throughout our time, we will work through the following objectives. Define Rosie, its origin, and the research behind it. Describe the seven principles of design. Explain how scoring is conducted and use pictures to assess environments and apply the principles. Before we begin, let's think about your childhood. Where were you when you were the happiest? What do you remember from that place? Jot those thoughts down. Take those places you just wrote and keep them in your mind as we compare our happiest memories to what children experience today. Most people write down physical memories that revolve around being outdoors. Do you think children today will have memories of outdoors? There's research that indicates children are not spending as much time outdoors as they have in generations prior. There are a variety of reasons, but a big one is technology. We know it's important for children's growth and development to be outdoors, in the sun, getting fresh air, using gross motor skills, and experiencing nature. Getting outdoors is a goal because of the benefits it has on children. But did you know there are also benefits on bringing the outdoors indoors? Remembering that place or the places you thought of from your childhood, think about how that compares to what children typically see in their classrooms. This is a picture of a classroom we would walk into, and it's a really good classroom, and many of the classrooms we see are good. But do we see those elements of nature the sights, the sounds, the smells outdoors. Are we seeing those in our classrooms today? Here are some things typically seen in classrooms. Bright primary colors, plastic and commercially made toys and furniture, hard surfaces, clutter, commercial and teacher made displays. I remember when I was in the classroom, my wish list was full of items like this. Bright plastic bins, plastic colorful dishes and cups. It was only towards the end of my classroom time when I was introduced to thinking differently and thinking about softer and more natural looks. We wanna look from an aesthetic point of view instead of a functional point of view. And when I say aesthetic, I mean concerned with beauty or the appreciation of beauty. We have all been trained to keep our cozy area away from our block area or put our art center near running water. Rosie takes us from that to thinking about how the spaces can inspire our children. It is subjective and meant to be a personal journey to bring the classroom from good to inspiring. This instrument was designed for a teacher, not for someone outside to come in and assess. There are going to be a lot of gray areas, so be prepared to be a bit subjective. That brings us to ROSIE. ROSIE stands for Rating Observation Scale for Inspiring Environments. This instrument focuses on a classroom's level of aesthetic beauty by looking through a lens of nature, color, furnishings, texture, displays, lighting, and focal points. It considers the function, adaptability of the space, and the dynamic needs and interests of those who inhabit the space. The book pictured on the left is the observation guide that you would use when assessing a classroom and is a companion guide for the book on the right, Inspiring Spaces for Young Children. This book encourages educators to create a beautiful and authentic learning space. It includes photographs and ideas to provide children with an intriguing environment where they can learn and grow. Both books are available for purchase through many book retailers. Before we begin the journey into Rosie, I am over the moon excited to share a message from Dr. Sandra Duncan, who's one of the authors of the instrument. Dr. Duncan led the program quality assessment team in a two day training where she left us feeling inspired and looking at classrooms from a new perspective. Please sit back and listen as Dr. Sandra Duncan shares a little bit about the thought behind Rosie. Hi, I'm Dr. Sandra Duncan. I can hear your wheels turning and imagine you saying underneath your breath, what? This is not what I signed up for. I'm an educator, a teacher, an early childhood professional. I am not an architect, an interior decorator, or a landscape designer. You may be thinking, 
I've had a hard enough time designing my bedroom, my house, or my apartment. You may be thinking, I don't have a creative bone in my body. Or you may have watched every episode of HGTV, Fixer Upper, or my new favorite hometown, but still don't have the first inkling of where to begin in your classroom. Ten years ago, I'd be right there in the same boat with you, never considering myself too creative or even remotely able to design classrooms. But there's one thing I have learned in the past 10 to 12 years. That's to listen to experts, not only in the education field, but also in other related or even remotely related fields. The seven principles of design align not only with early childhood education best practices, but with the field of architecture, interior design, environmental psychology, biophilic and empathic design, psychoanalysis, human psychology, and even brain research. The fact of the matter is, when it comes to designing early childhood classrooms, you can learn from anything and anyone. You can be inspired, but most importantly, you can inspire. Once you begin looking at classroom environments from the seven principles of design, you assume a new perspective. In 2008, I got together with four other early childhood educators and talked about how most early childhood environments are institutional, they're cookie cutter, they're filled with plastic and bright primary colors. We lamented how little signs of nature, how little nature was found in most environments, with the exception perhaps of a sometimes half alive plant in the science area. We discussed the minimal respect of children's work, especially in classroom displays. There was a very lively discussion of Reggio Emilia's philosophy of light and illumination, as well as the layers and layers of texture and the reflection of community, which is all infused into the Reggio Emilia environments. All this conversation led to the writing of Inspiring Spaces for Young Children in its companion book, Rating Observation Scale for Inspiring Spaces, both published in 2010. Inspiring Spaces and Rating Observation Scale, or ROSI, created quite a stir because in 2010, there was no one in our field putting together the two words, inspiring and classroom. Up to this point, we all thought about classroom design in terms of functionality. That is, you know, like put the art easel in the art area next to a source of water, or put the block area in an off the beaten path so children's constructions would not get knocked over or disturbed. Yes, the two words inspiring and classroom back then were rarely put together. These words beauty and classroom environments were not at the top of educators' minds. Now, however, we have the research that suggests beauty is a significant contributor to children's acquisition of knowledge because beauty instills wonder and wonder promotes lifelong learning. If you're interested in this notion, check out one of my latest books called Through a Child's Eyes, How Classroom in Design Inspires Learning and Wonder. I'm proud to be a small part of this presentation and know you will learn many strategies for creating inspiring environments and spaces for young children. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Dr. Duncan for that wonderful insight. Now let's dive into the observation guide. The guide is broken down into seven principles. Each of these principles will help you make your classroom bloom. Each principle has three to 13 indicators. 
Within each indicator are three levels of growth. Each level builds off the previous. Most of you are probably familiar with the environment rating scales. Think about the seven principles as the items like health and safety, room arrangement, dramatic play. The indicators are all specific expectations like sanitizing before and after meals and having centers accessible. The rosy levels of growth are like the ratings in ERS from one to seven, where one is the inadequate level and seven is excellent. Here is a sample page from the observation guide. You will see on the top of the page in the green circle is the principle. Here we are looking at principle five, displays enhance environment. Along the left side of the page, circled in black, are the indicators. This principle has 13 indicators, but we're only looking at three of those 13. Each indicator starts with beginning levels of quality and build off each other. If you look at indicator two, the yellow box shows the progression and each are assigned a number one, two, or three. Some of the levels in this indicator give examples. If you look at indicator three, the orange circles illustrate these examples that can be found on some of the levels. Now that you have an idea of the layout, we're going to discuss each of the seven principles in ROSI. Listed are the seven principles of design. After a review of each of the seven principles, you can reflect on one thing you would like to add or change in your classroom to incorporate that principle of design. Sometimes having things written down can help in making us accountable for the change. Let's look at our first principle, nature inspires beauty. This girl is using seashells to match uppercase and lowercase letters. Yes, this activity could be done with a worksheet or plastic letters, but think about the experience using natural items, the feeling of the shells in their hands, the variations in the shells as far as shape, color, and texture. Think about the questions and conversations that could arise as they use them. There is research that discusses the effects of plastic material versus living and natural materials. The plastic materials remove a sense of calm and steal beauty. Start thinking about how to inspire your classroom with nature. Just as you are immersed in the natural world of sights, sounds, tastes, smells, and textures, classrooms should reflect the wonders of nature that surround you. As children interact with nature, they deepen their understanding and appreciation of their places and roles as caretakers of the planet. The classroom should reflect the wonders of nature that surround you. Here are some of the main points within this principle. Does your classroom include some or all of these? It's a great first step to have living things in the classroom, but think about how to extend that into experiences, artwork, and activities. It looks for different types of living things that nature items being used in a sensory experience like leaves in the sensory table, creative experiences like painting with twigs, and cognitive experiences like measuring the weight of rocks. Items from nature displayed on various surfaces, so your surfaces thinking about your ceilings, your shelves, counters, tables, walls, window, floors, so items like a hanging shell curtain or maybe a seagrass rug, a photograph of nature on the wall also looks at children's work is inspired by nature. So maybe a clay sculpture of a tree, a frame drawing of a bird or weaving with natural objects. It also looks at nature used in a practical way, maybe wood slices as a dish or rocks as bookends, tree branches as a curtain rod. And finally, nature items that encourage tactile, auditory and olfactory exploration, like maybe sorting shells, a water fountain or smelling herbs. Take a minute to reflect and write down one thing you can do in your space to inspire beauty through nature. The second principle is color generates interest. When you go to paint rooms in your home, what colors do you look for? Do you use bright colors or soft natural colors? Think of your classroom as you would your home. What mood is set by the colors you choose? I know for me, bright colors make me anxious and overload my senses. Proper use of color can create a mood, define a space, and reflect children's homes and communities. 
Used negatively, color can be overpowering, confusing, and overstimulating. A neutral background for your classroom with a few well-chosen accent colors will create interest that's focused on the children and the adults who inhabit the space. Some of the items within this principle are furniture is wood-toned or neutral colors. I do see a lot of natural shelving and furniture when I'm in classrooms. Making sure the decor elements reflect current color trends. There's use of neutral colors, limited use of accent colors, but those colors being repeated throughout. And finally, the accent colors being integrated through paint or fabric and unconventional or authentic objects. You wanna use color intentionally. It doesn't mean get rid of all the colors, but use it purposely. Too many primary colors can negatively impact behavior. Think about nature's palette. Look outside the classroom door and see the beauty of nature. What colors are currently in your space? What would you like to change or add? Take a minute to reflect and write down one thing you can do in your space around principle two, color generates interest. Now let's take a look at a sample classroom. There are some good elements here, like open space to allow for play, child's artwork, wood tone in the furniture, some possible enhancements that can be made thinking about our principles are adding living things, displaying nature on various surfaces, adding children's artwork that's inspired by nature, nature used in practical ways, maybe in dramatic play, and using some neutral colors with accent colors. Our third principle is furniture defines space. The furniture in the space sets the tone for what is going to happen. Think about your own home. Your kitchen has a table and chairs for the purpose of eating, while your living room has couches or recliners to be able to relax. The furnishings in your center should also reflect the types of activities that may occur. Furnishings are used to identify classroom areas such as dramatic play, blocks, art, music, and science. When these furnishings are authentic and sized and placed properly, children's play will increase in quality and depth. The placement of furniture is just as important as the furniture itself. When creating centers, think about the activity and how much room is needed. If your quiet reading area is large and near the door, does it give the feeling of a quiet, private area to read? Also consider the purpose of the center. For example, an art area should allow them to create and view their artwork, while a music area includes instruments to use and some way for them to record their compositions. Also, try and reduce the appearance of staff or personal items. Try to utilize a closet or a cabinet. We want to make this space feel child friendly and like it's their own. Now that we reviewed principle three, furniture defines space, take a moment to write down how you will incorporate this principle in your classroom. The next principle is texture adds depth. When children are babies, we focus on those tactile experiences by giving them materials to stimulate their sense of touch. We have soft items like rugs and toys that have soft rubbery ends or furry features. This principle reminds us to continue that process with our preschool children. Notice the various types of storage like the wicker basket and a weaved fabric basket. The carpet provides that soft touch while the leather pillow offers a different feel. Texture in the environment offers visual interest and depth and provides children with unique tactile experiences. As children interact with sensory elements, they sharpen their observational skills and find motor abilities through the language of weaving, sculptures, and textiles. We sometimes can't change the main flooring, but think about adding mats or rugs that reflect nature. Conventional items like pillows, woven baskets, and tablecloths can be added to the space. Also think about some unconventional items like shutters, a birdcage, or a beehive. Hanging paper artwork is common, but this principle explores other types of children's work as well. Maybe some clay pieces, stone designs, weaving items like pot holders or scarves. Possibilities are endless. Take a moment to reflect and write down one thing you can do to add principle four, texture adds depth into your space.
Here's another sample classroom. We can see a designated reading area that includes a soft rug, a smaller kitchen table in the kitchen that matches the kitchen's shelving size, and there's some hanging children's artwork. There's some possible enhancements when thinking about Rosie, and they can include maybe setting the table in dramatic play, adding authentic materials like cookbooks, pot holders, really thinking about moving away from plastic, having carpeting that matches the space, include textiles like clay, stones, fabric squares, and framing children's artwork. Our next principle, display enhances environment. By eliminating clutter, arranging storage materials, and highlighting children's work, the classroom becomes a backdrop to honor all who occupy the space. Here's some artwork using natural objects. Think about the experiences the child has while creating with things like rocks, stones, and bark. Think about the conversations and questions that could occur. This is just one piece of the principle, but what a beautiful one. Now let's look at some of the concepts behind principle five. We love to display children's artwork. Let's think about how and where to display it. Taping a piece of artwork is probably what is most commonly seen. But think about how you would display artwork in your home. Would you tape it randomly on a cabinet? Or would you purchase a frame and display it in a more appropriate location? Children's artwork should be honored in the same way in the classroom. Hanging some of the artwork at children's eye level allows them to view and reflect on it. Think about what the piece is and where it makes the most sense to display. Think of how you can hang the display on different surfaces such as walls, ceilings, windows, floors. When you're organizing materials, we want to make it organized and look less cluttered. You also want to consider using neutral colored or natural colored bins. Also be creative when displaying some materials. Instead of a bin for crayons, maybe a silverware holder instead. Can you drill holes in a brick and put the scissors in it? Also be sure bins and shelves are labeled so children know where to return the materials when finished. When you think about center labels, consider having the children make them or using computer generated ones ensuring lettering is correct, using uppercase and lowercase letters appropriately. Now let's take a look at two different storage shelves. Take a moment to think about which one looks more inviting and why. Removing the plastic bins and using clear or natural bins make a difference. Also, the materials are displayed to be inviting. The magnifying glasses next to the branches. Take a minute to reflect and write down one thing you can do to add principle five, displays enhance environment to your classroom. Next, we have principle six, elements height and ambiance. Think about light from your perspective. When you want to calm, what do you do? You turn down the lights. When we wake up and need to energize, we turn those lights up bright. The same is true for our classroom. Look at the lighting and how it contributes to the energy in the room. Multiple sources of light create an ambiance of relaxation and contemplation. By using multiple sources of light in supportive ways, children are able to interact creatively with others and the environment. Most rooms have one or two main sets of lights that go on or off. It would be great if you can dim these when needed. Also consider lamps and other ways to add light to the classroom. Giving children the opportunity to play and use light in an educational way can enhance the ambiance. Think flashlights, light tables, and garden lights. Aside from light, we want to think about the sounds children can make and hear. Are there opportunities for natural sounds like rain sticks or a sound machine? Finally, ambiance is heightened when using and displaying items to reflect natural light from windows. This doesn't mean covering your windows with stuff, but having materials like prisms or x-rays nearby for children to use the light in an educational sense. If you put items on the windows, you want them to be transparent, so you're still allowing sun to stream into the classroom. So what are some ways you can add light to your classroom? Here we'll look at three different ideas based on the principle elements height and ambiance. Think about if you have these elements already in your classroom, or if not, are they things you would like to have? The first one, multiple sources of light that spotlight areas. 
shadow play elements for children like flashlights, spotlights, overhead projectors, and transparent objects on windows or window sills that use light as an educational tool like crystals, x-rays, prisms. Now take a minute to reflect and write down one thing you can do to add principle six, elements, height, and ambiance to your classroom. When you enter a classroom, what do you see? Start looking at it from a child's perspective. Is the space welcoming? Does it generate excitement and interest? This is what we'll look at for principle seven, focal points attract attention. This principle looks at what children see when entering a classroom. A distinct focal point can highlight interactive learning centers, children's artwork, and architectural elements or beautiful artifacts. Best practice would include a learning center with shelving placement so you can see the materials as you enter. It would also include a focal point. Maybe your art center is located in this space and displayed on the table is a sculpture on a textured mat. The shelving may have framed artwork displayed or 3D work that the children created. The thought process is to really think intentionally about what is being placed and where it is located include defined focal points. So maybe you have a camping theme and a lantern and a sleeping bag are displayed in dramatic play. Also look at the walls when you enter. Are they empty or cluttered? Be intentional on what is hung and how it is spaced. Take a minute to think about your classroom. When a child walks in, what's the first thing that they see? They may see cots or mats, cubbies, a desk, some cluttered or maybe even empty walls, Sometimes we arrange our entryway for convenience. For example, the cubbies are near the door because it's easy for taking off and putting on coats. But think about it from a child's perspective and how what they view as they enter can impact their day. What do you want them to see? How do you want the children to feel when they empty your space? Take a minute to reflect and write down one thing you can do to incorporate principle seven Focal points attract attention. Now let's look at one more classroom and reflect on what we see that's good and what we can enhance. You'll notice there's signage for the manipulative center and it is grammatically correct. There's labeled bins for materials, natural tables and chairs. Some enhancements might include adding more child made displays, framing the work, it looks like a lot of commercial and teacher produced displays. Maybe some child made or die cut letters for center signs and some storage for the stuffed animals. Starting with these small changes can make a world of difference in the classroom. Now let's talk about conducting the assessment. First decide who will be assessing in the classroom. With other POIs, having a trained and reliable external assessor is recommended to ensure there's an objective assessment conducted. An outsider can come in and help a teacher learn, but this was really designed more for the teacher. Decide on how often, whether it's every six months, quarterly, Rosie was designed to be a journey. It's important to conduct more than one assessment on a regular schedule. It's also recommended that the same person conduct the observation each time. This will ensure that there is a consistency at what and how you are seeing things. This instrument is also different than others in that it is to be used when children are not present in the classroom. So you'll need to schedule a time when the classroom is not in use. The scoring of Rosie is based on growth, similar to a garden. This is a journey, a journey of growth and development. Each level of growth is associated with a number, one for sprouting, two for budding, and three for blooming. I love that even with scoring, there's a natural view on it. The authors really embraced beauty and nature within this instrument. After observing your space, you're going to calculate by adding the numbers you circled for each principle. You'll see each principle will give you a rating of sprouting, budding, or blooming. You will then add the totals from each column to get your overall score. Remember, these scores are just to guide you through the journey of creating inspiration in your space. Some things may be unattainable due to room restrictions, and that's okay. Look at the principles and identify your principles of excellence and principles for improvement. You wanna start small and with the most important thing that you think is necessary to make your environment more inspiring. 
a lot of items are interrelated, unlike other assessment instruments where it is this or that. After you create some goals, you can include them in a continuous quality improvement plan. Then decide when you would like to reassess, maybe in three months or six months. Again, remember the same person who conducted the observation the first time should be the one doing it again to ensure it's being looked at with the same lens. Here are some resources that can help you on your journey to creating an inspiring space. I hope this journey has inspired you to begin looking at your classroom with a new lens. I will leave you with this quote, children are miracles. We must make it our job to create with reverence and gratitude, a space that is worthy of a miracle. Thank you for watching and thank you for all you do for the children in your care.